rugby is in an absolute mess, let's be honest. I'm here to solve it. Or at least get you thinking about how rugby could potentially solve it in the long term. Now, I've been thinking quite a lot about this one, so I'm really hoping you'll get stuck into this. And more importantly, give me your thoughts on the, some existential issues that rugby has got, how we could get over them, and what is holding us back as a sport. And I, I'm going to look at that by summarising the, the, the state of play as I see it, and then offering a solution from within rugby and one from outside of rugby. And I've got um, quite a controversial thought as well, um, which I'll save till the end. Uh, so let's get into it. I'm Tim, this is Egg Chasers. If I haven't earned your subscription, I really hope that I do on this video. I love my rugby, as uh, as you'll see. This is a proper rugby noise topic. So uh, let's get stuck in. Uh, leave your comments, hit like, share, uh, and um, and subscribe. So, rugby. Um, let's have a look at this. What, what does rugby look like right now? Um, financial instability all over the place. Teams going bust. Arguments between unions. Arguments between competitions. Club versus country. Nation versus nation. It's, it's not a great picture. And so just to summarise how rugby is administered, you have got World Rugby, the governing body, who uh, are responsible for the Rugby World Cup every four years. They're responsible for the Sevens World Cup as well every four years. They're responsible for the World Seven Series, which takes the place around the world, uh, takes place around the world through a calendar year and takes in some of the places which are off the beaten track in a rugby sense, places like Dubai and Hong Kong and the USA. Um, so that's another entity. You've got the Under 20s World Cup, which is an annual event, World Rugby Look After, as well as the Pacific Nations Cup, which is a, a more recent uh, thing which World Rugby have um, started up. They are um, re representing the 120 unions, national rugby teams, that take part in one or all of those competitions. And that is World Rugby. Right, that's international rugby at the top level. You then have other international competitions like the Six Nations Championship. There's the Rugby Championship as well. Um, and the Six Nations Championship is not... World Rugby have no jurisdiction there. It's its own entity. And the Six Nations, the countries there, they have pulled collectively together and they negotiate and share the spoils on TV rights, um, on sponsors and all that sort of thing. So... World Rugby do not own the Six Nations. They would love to because it's massively profitable, huge heritage, very, very valuable commodity. And that is why World Rugby are desperate to try and align things globally so that they can kind of get in on this a little bit and link it up with their annual global competition. It's also the reason why nations like Georgia and even South Africa are desperate to try and get involved because it's worth big money uh, and big prestige. It's also the reason why the nations that are involved are very reluctant to open up because they're doing all right at the minute. Thank you very much. Um, and that is a theme of rugby that you're, you're going to hear about a lot on this video is how there are different entities that are pulling in different directions. And it's a short term way of thinking that ultimately doesn't help. So th there we go. We've got World Rugby. You've got competitions like the Six Nations. Then you've got national unions like, and I'm just going to pick England Rugby as an example, but you can map this onto any union uh, in the world. It's just obviously the one I know best. And talking about pulling in different directions, England Rugby both look after grassroots rugby and they also look after the national teams. And those are two very different agendas that require very different types of administration. And do not necessarily sit happily side by side. So that is just, this theme is going to keep on coming up. Um, the money that England Rugby get derives from its 2,000 member clubs or whatever, 2,000 odd member clubs and two and a half million member players all paying their subs and stuff up the clubs. Um, that's how the administration is run, but they get the bulk of their money from England Rugby and mainly from the men's senior team and those big, big events at Twickenham. Uh, they're, not, they're not doing great financially at the minute. Um, lots of reasons for that, which I don't, don't need to get into, maybe on another video. But um, the, the players that play for England Rugby, again, talking about being pulled in different directions, the players that play for England Rugby also play for Gallagher Premiership clubs. There are 11 of them currently, because Wasps and Worcester, earlier in the season, um, went bust. And they're going to re-enter the league, hopefully somewhere, sometime soon. 
Um, but there are 11 Premiership clubs, and those players uh, represent those clubs. The the Premiership is desperate to get the best and the most time it can with these players, but those players are also uh, being pulled in different directions for their national team with competitions like the Six Nations, Summer Tours, Autumn Internationals, Rugby World Cup. And so everybody wants their pound of flesh, wants to get what they can out of their players. And that means you have club versus country push and pull. And that means compromises are necessary. So you've got a situation where, in the case of England, I can talk about with authority at least, um, but please tell me what it's like in, uh, in countries that you know well. So in England... There's negotiations and compromises have to happen where premiership players have who also play for England have to have mandated rest periods. They have a limit on the number of games they can play. That's their compromise to the national team. And then the national team compromises, OK, we will only pick players from the premiership to help you keep the good players and, and the best possible product in your league. But it's not perfect. It doesn't work perfectly for everyone. There's compromises needed by all. And ultimately, the only losers in that situation are us. Well, and the, and the players as well, because uh, they can't make as much money as they could. We don't get to see the best possible products that we can because compromises are having to be made. Um, there's also another entity. So you've got world rugby. You've got these international competitions. You've got uh, national unions. You've got domestic leagues. And then you've got private equity now. CVC bought a 14% stake in the Six Nations and um, they also purchased a 27% stake in the Gallagher Premiership and in what is now the URC. So private equity is is taking its slice as well and that's having a, a consequence on commercial revenues that are being taken up. It, effectively, these clubs and national unions took uh, some upfront cash in exchange for long-term revenue and it's not panning out too well as it currently stands. I mean, Premiership clubs are also in the Heineken Champions Cup. There's another little entity that's another little uh, layer pulling in different directions. They want their best players available. The players enjoy playing in that competition. That's a great showcase if you want to be an international player and you're not there yet. And it's a great competition. But again, all these different factors uh, are, are pulling and they don't always pull in the same direction. There's currently no promotion and relegation in the Gallagher Premiership. Um, we'll wait and see if they actually return that. They said it was only temporary, but I will believe that when I see it. And regardless, when promotion was a factor, it wasn't really promotion and, and relegation. It was it was kind of ring fenced by another name because the money that clubs would get was fr a fraction of that which the shareholders of Premiership Rugby got. The clubs that were in there and have the shares get much more money and the the newbies that want to try and join them don't have the shares well you're not getting any money then and I, and that just kind of not it didn't fix it formally but it indirectly fixed the league so that whoever went down if they're a shareholder would bounce straight back up and any team coming up wouldn't really be able to compete which is why what Exeter Chiefs managed to do when they came up uh, from the championship massively underfunded compared to other premiership clubs and yet managed to build and grow and become a shareholder eventually and then win the competition and the Champions Cup. It makes their their journey all the more incredible. So the Premiership clubs, again, just using the Premiership and England as an example, they generate money from broadcast deals, from sponsorship, from match day revenue, all of which is hugely affected by the ability to get their players out on the field. And the same is true for Six Nations and for England rugby. So... <laughs> All sorts of levers pulling in all sorts of dire directions. I think I've summarised rugby fairly well there. And I can summarise it just in terms of that pulling in different directions. Let's have a look at something different then. And the NFL. And this is relevant to rugby because both American football and rugby have the same origins. They were a variation of the early football rules. Rugby's began at rugby school in England. In the case of American football, it began in the northeastern prestigious colleges in America. Um, and so they have the same origin, but that's pretty much where it changes. And the fundamental difference between American football and rugby is the administration of it and the, and the ethos of the sport. Because 
the ethos of American football has always been com competition and competitiveness means everybody wins and very different to rugby pulling in different directions. If we all pull in the same direction and we all come together and even if some of us take a bit of a hit in the short term, we will all win in the long term. So um, the value of the NFL right now is estimated at $143 billion, which is equivalent to Netflix. So let that sink in for a minute. It's one of the most valuable entertainment brands on planet Earth, which is mind-boggling when you consider it's 32 teams in one country, and yet it has a worldwide audience. It has some of the biggest TV and sponsorship deals and best played, best paid athletes in any sport anywhere in the world. It's a, it's a phenomenon. And as I say, every single part of the sport, every team, every player, every sponsor, every broadcaster, everybody is pulling in one direction to make it as profitable and entertaining as possible. Now, this guy uh, is called Burt Bell. And he was one of the, well, I think he's with uh, a coach at Philadelphia in the early days. And he was a commissioner of, commissioner of the NFL in the early days. The NFL started in 1920. It was the American professional football conference and they just wanted to formalize this competition that was kind of starting and make it more professional so they got a bunch of teams together i think they formed in a car de met in a car dealership and and agreed uh, on the league um but this guy bert bell he had the principle he, he coined the phrase any given sunday and what he said was on any given sunday any team should be able to beat any other team and any given sunday the name of a film about American football with Al Pacino, uh, among others, brilliant film. Um, and Burt Bell, he was the guy that, that that coined that phrase. And the principle of American football from the very early days was competitiveness between teams. So that meant that even if you lose, everybody wins. And uh, American sport and American football is cutthroat. It's ruthless. Players will just get cut like that with no sentimentality whatsoever. However, they also work together. It's kind of um, socialist capitalism in a, in, a, in a weird way. We could, get, we could go down a rabbit hole there, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting approach. Every, the drama and the stories are maximised at absolutely every turn. So, for example, this is one thing that they did back in the early days, in the very earliest days, Burt Bell's days, they would have... The first half of the season, the fixtures would be the weaker teams from the previous season playing the weaker teams and the stronger teams playing the stronger teams. And what did that mean? That meant for the first half of the season, there wasn't one team that was out of contention. Everyone was kind of looked like they still had a shot. And even if that was just camouflaging the weaknesses of some teams, it made for the better story and a better product. It made it more interesting, more engaging and that was good for the people watching and that meant you got more bums on seats and when television arrived you got more people watching the game on tv and that's a really simple thing which they did back then and the nfl still does that today the amateur draft is another thing the principle that the weakest teams from one season get the first pick on the amateur players coming through the college system which equalizes things a little bit for the following season firstly and also it creates a whole new raft of storylines where you want to know about who these young players that could be joining your team are coming from. And we're always talking about rugby, how we need to get people out uh, out there and l l let people know who these people are. Well, it's like a soap opera. The, the first draft, the first pick in the NFL draft is someone that NFL fans will know the backstory of. They'll know all about them. So, I mean, that's just, it's, it's all joined up. And it's not just NFL draft. You've got... Um, NFL fantasy football. There's, again, this is all storytelling. Yes, it's engagement and it's interest for fans, another way that they can enjoy it, but it means more people are likely to watch it at the weekends. It means that you've got loads more sponsors that you can open things up to, podcasts, TV shows, online content, all off the back of this, which is all pointing you back to your one product. NFL films as well have been absolutely amazing because it's all centralised. You can make movie-like productions to tell the story of your sport and compare NFL films to rugby and this great opportunity it's got, which it sounds like it's doing its best to mess up, where finally we got a drive to survive type Netflix documentary. And what did we hear? 
early in the Six Nations this season, some of the teams don't want to let the cameras into the dressing room. There's arguments about what they can and can't see. You just you know, rugby doesn't help itself sometimes, whereas the NFL maximizes the drama at all times. I'll introduce you to another person, Pete Rozell. He was 33 years old when he became commissioner, and he came, he became commissioner at a crucial time because there was the uh, AFL as a massive challenger to the NFL, and to the point where the two different leagues were nicking players off each other, nicking draft picks off each other, and Pete Rozell managed to unify those two leagues, bring them together to what we now know as the the AFC and NFC um, conferences under the NFL banner and created uh, the Super Bowl between the winners of both of those conferences. And what he also did in the process was negotiate one centralised TV deal. And here's a key thing. When Pete Rozelle negotiated that one TV deal nationally, some of the teams lost money. Pittsburgh lost money, Cleveland lost money, Baltimore lost money because their local TV deals at the time were really good. He managed to convince them to lose money so their slice of the pie would get a bit smaller. However, the principle of that was in order to grow a bigger pie that they could take a... take the Suddenly they would have a much bigger slice that they were taking as a result. And it's that kind of long-term and collective thinking which has been at the heart of the success at the NFL and it's the one thing that is so lacking in rugby because people are just trying to protect their little slice of the pie rather than thinking about how big the pie could be. Um, I'm getting hungry now. If you haven't hit subscribe already and you're still watching, come on, hit subscribe, yeah? <laughs> Leave your comments, let me know. So Pete Rizal was all about just not cannibalising your own sport. Um, and he was also big on storytelling as well. So here's one thing Pete Rizal did, which, which blew my mind. As someone who works in media and radio and TV and stuff, Pete Rizal... Um, Again, American football was trying to compete with baseball, which was the biggest sport. Pete Rozell would have people write up the stories of each game and send it to the journalists. So even if they weren't there at the stadium, they would know what was going on and they might write the story up. And that also meant he could control the narrative a little bit. So these stories were told. And I can tell you, as someone that works in rugby, there are some people that just get it and they could not be more helpful and they're, and they're brilliant. But there are some who... You just, it seems like they think you're a, you're trying to put a banana skin in front of them when actually when you, I want to sell the sport as much as you do. So help me help you, um, to, to use that uh, Jerry Maguire phrase. So there we go. It even comes down to things like um, the, the kit in, in, in the NFL. There's one TV deal. There's one NFL network uh, with all the podcasts and TV shows and all, all of that. Um, the, the kits. Think about the Premiership. There's 11 different kit manufacturers, 11 different shirt sponsors, um, 11 different travel partners. NFL centrally negotiated, collectively bargained, massive headline tickets, and then and then split. Everybody wins, ultimately. Dallas Cowboys could pro possibly make a bit more money if they kept it all themselves. However, if they kept it all themselves... And there weren't the salary cap and the salary floor and the, the, the split revenues. The product that the Dallas Cowboys were part of would not be as big. And therefore, the Dallas Cowboys would overall make less. So ticket revenue is another one. Teams get 60% of their gate receipts. 40% gets put into a central pot, which is shared equally between all teams. So you have got some incredibly valuable franchises, um, even like Little Green Bay is a you know a, a massively valuable entity and Dallas Cowboys right up there at the top as a as a massive Texas behemoth and they all compete together. So how can rugby get here? It is by having a long-term time horizon and having as many different factions and entities in the sport pulling in the same direction trying to make the most engaging entertaining product with the best storylines as possible trying to grow the biggest possible pie that we can, and then everyone take their slice. And that's good for everyone, most of all us consuming the sport. So, um, have a vision. What, what we've got to imagine is, what, what, could, what do we want rugby to look 20 years from now? And what I want to look at with rugby 20 years from now is I want to, I want to be going to a World Cup and thinking Georgia might win the Rugby World Cup. 
uh, Fiji might win the Rugby World Cup. If you could go to a Rugby World Cup 20, 30 years time and 20 different teams could win, how much better is that to watch? Like, I'm, I'm really pleased for Chile getting to the Rugby World Cup. I don't really care about their game against England because I know what the result's going to be. On any given Sunday or Friday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever it is, any team cannot be any team at the Rugby World Cup. And until that happens, you're not going to have... It's not going to be as big as it can be. So that needs to be the starting point. How can we grow the pie big enough that Fiji could win the World Cup if if they have a fair wind and a few things go in their favour or a bit of luck or um, a purple patch? How could Georgia um, potentially win the Rugby World Cup in the future? The issue with that is because you've got these different entities pulling in different directions, the Six Nations sides, they don't want to give Georgia... Uh, an entry to it because they want to hold on to what they've already got all that nice big six nations money they're not thinking 20 years in what if the what if the pie for the six nations was so big you could have three leagues and um three leagues of six abc whatever and the interest in all of them would be massive such that you could have a big tv deal that suddenly instead of 15 games would have 45 games how big could that TV deal be? And then if you took your slice of your pie out of that, wouldn't that be bigger than what you currently have now? But there is not this long-term thinking. There is, I want to hold on to what I've got. And I don't know how rugby gets past that, but some turkeys have got to vote for Christmas or at least be brave enough to see the long-term reward of short-term hits. And this is mainly looking at the big nations. So... We've got to spread more money and resources and create more opportunity in countries like Fiji and Georgia and Japan and the USA and Canada in order that we can have the sort of Rugby World Cup spectacle that we want. Because until we do, rugby's potential is never going to be realised. And what would what would Pete Rozelle have done? What would um, Bert Bell do? That should be the question we're we're looking at, and I want to finish with a an, a positive example as well as the NFL is a great example, but French domestic rugby is also a brilliant example of how to do it. So, the French um, have the the top fourteen, brilliant competition, best domestic league in the world uh, currently, and they have um, Pro D two their second division with another 14 teams. They also have a third, uh, I think they might even have two more professional leagues. Definitely the um, third division is still a really good standard. Um, but you have a TV deal that's been brokered with Canal Plus, And it means that on a Thursday, you can sit down and watch a Pro D2 game every week, just like there's Thursday night football in America. There's Thursday night Pro D2. And then across the weekend, you have time slots which follow both of these leagues. 65% of all of the television revenue goes to the top 14 sides. 35% of it goes to the Pro D2 sides. As a consequence, it means relegation from the top 14, whilst not desirable, isn't catastrophic because there's still TV money there. There's still good teams. There's still well-attended grounds. There's still interest. And you can go down, rebuild, come back up, and it isn't end of days type stuff. And the teams in the top 14 do not ring fence themselves from, from ever. Good. You've had big clubs going down, Beeritz, for example, um, and you've had unknown clubs coming up and, and doing really well. And as a consequence of that, even in the non-traditional rugby parts of France, like in the in the north, Normandy area, you have teams that are, that are springing up. You have local municipalities who are investing in their local rugby team and it is reaping rewards. And look at what it's doing for the national team. You've got all these towns and cities that are represented. They also have quota systems in place. So you have to have, I think next season, it's going to be 17 out of a match day squad, have to be French. And it is doing amazing things for the French national team. It's doing amazing things for the TV deal, which I think is about three times the size of the uh, English premiership deal with comparable, or it might be double, uh, with comparable populations, the rugby TV deal and interest in France is going through the roof. And there's a player drain from England to France currently. Again, I'm just using England as an example, but you can map this on. And look, here's the final thing I want to think about. This is my little controversial point to finish on. When you look back to, what was it? Well, let me just jump back a second to um, when the NFL and the AFL were two competing separate leagues and they were cannibalizing each other you might see where i'm going now 
Um, it was similar as Phil, um, who who is on the Egg Chasers podcast with me, pointed out the other day. It's quite similar to when Rugby Union and Rugby League split in 1895. Those two codes split. This is a little picture of when there was the clash of codes. I think it was in the late 90s and the, the all-conquering Wigan team played, played a, a doubleheader game, one game of league and one game of union against uh, the all-conquering Bath team. Um, it's a bit of a one-off. The videos are on YouTube, quite entertaining to watch. Well, actually not. Anyway, uh, that's going off point. Point being is this sounds preposterous, but if you were treating rugby, if you were someone from the NFL coming in from the outside without all the emotional attachment to rugby, that's what you would do. You would look at this and say, we need to bring those two codes back together, like with the AFL and the NFL. Rugby league and rugby union coming back under one umbrella. When you think 30 years in the future, 50 years in the future, that is the sort of big picture thinking, I'm just going to float out there. I'm not saying it will happen. I don't think it will. But that is the level of thinking that I would go for. Because if you could bring those codes together, um, I think you stand a shot at making rugby have the the kind of competitiveness and the kind of potent realizing the kind of potential that it absolutely has. But there is there are some easy things it can do if some turkeys are willing to to vote for Christmas or some people are willing to take a um a short term hit for a long term much, much bigger gain. Um nice one for watching. I appreciate that. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that I quite enjoy thinking about. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of match day stuff and a lot of game related stuff, but this is sort of bigger and more existential. So, uh, again, if you're still watching now and you appreciate this kind of video as well, I would so appreciate you sharing, leaving your comments and, uh, and hitting subscribe. I'm Tim. This is Egg Chasers and I will see you on the next video. Nice one.